Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the show. Old New Beach in the sand, I think of you. Welcome back. We have a very special show for you today. As you know, I'm Kurt Williams, a spiritualist metaphysician. And because of some of the current events that are going on, like what is happening to P. Diddy, for instance, and that big, you know, takedown situation, I have a story like that. A uh, cautionary tale in to how a person may get caught up into all that. I understand how these things can happen. So I think this would be a good opportunity for me to tell this particular story. Well, it all started basically, like I said, as a spiritualist, my spirit talks to me. It's been doing it all my life, but I didn't always realize what it was. Sometimes I would call it guardian angel or whatever. So let me go back to my senior year in high school when it was time to go to the prom. So we're getting ready and we were gonna have a contest of who's gonna have the cutest date, who's gonna be the best dressed and all this kind of thing. Well, you know, I recruited my date from out of town. I went to Westchester High to get my date and then but there was a fella at the school who was smart enough to, to get a girl who, who was at the school, but we didn't pay too much attention to her. We grew up with her. You know, around the way, girl, but eh, we wouldn't pay, pay too much attention. But this fellow was named Eddie Denard, and when Eddie showed up with Janice Hines, they were dressed alike, and Janice had blossomed all of a sudden. And we all looked, and we was like, wow, did you see Janice Hines and Eddie? Yeah, well, the contest is over. So anyway, she had blossomed, and so... About maybe three or four years later, I was on my way home from work. I was doing construction work and I was driving my truck home and I'm going up the street and something told me, as we know now as my spirit said, Kurt, go down the street and pass by Janice's house just in case you see her. So, I, okay, well, whatever, you know. So I went this way and then I turned that way. And as soon as I got to her house, she had a, some hedges. Right as I got up to the hedges, she stepped out from behind the hedges as if she was turning to look down the street looking for some children, perhaps, that she may have been playing with or something. Now, when I tell you 
It was a mind-blowing experience. I truly mean that. Quantum entanglement is when you feel a pop in your head and two particles that are different are... Two particles seem to be... Like a, par a piece of me must have went into her because and it got stuck there. Because this woman stepped out and she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. She had these Bo Derek braids. Remember Bo Derek in the in ten? And she looked like she had these Bo Derek braids, and she had been working out, and she had these muscles in her calves and in her thighs. And I looked at her. Not only me, but everybody kind of went a little crazy because of this particular woman, Janice. So I'm I've got Janice in my head. I'm like I go. I'm thinking about Janice for a day. So I finally get in touch with her because I'm gonna see if I can make her my woman and. The first thing Janet asked me is if I could introduce her to my friend, Greg Haddon. <laughs> oh, okay. Eh, well, so that was the end of that. Anyway, fast forward about three years. I appeared on a little show called The Love Connection. Our first guest, he considers himself an all-around athlete. Former model. And he held the title of Mr. Black Los Angeles. And he says that most women get the wrong impression of it. Please welcome Kurt Williams. Hey, Kurt. Oh, what's up? Have a seat. Why do you think uh, women get the wrong impression of you, Kurt? Well, because I'm a confident person. And they misconstrue that as arrogance and conceit. Well, it's not really. I'm just confident. I think I know what I'm doing. Did <laughs> you think so? Yeah. I just learned to let a woman make the first move. Well, at a young age, my mother said, as long as you let the woman make the move, how can you lose? So after this show aired, I get a call from the people at Love Connection saying that a man called them, an agent, and he wanted to put me in commercials. So I said, wow, commercials? Okay, let's see. That's cool. I was a singer at the time. Um, as a matter of fact, I got a call from an agent one time where they wanted me to be a temptation because Dennis Edwards was in Vegas punching holes in the walls. <laughs> so I went and got ready to go and they started fitting me for, about to fit me for clothes when I got a phone call that said, never mind, because Ollie Woodson, who sang Treat Her Like a Lady, said he was going to be good from now on. So that was in, at the end of that. So I did get a chance to sing with the West Coast version of the Delphonics. But anyway, so I was already on my way to an entertainment career. And I get this call from this guy in Hot Springs, which is right next to Palm Springs. And he says, hey, yeah, we'd like to put you in some things. And, and um, my place is out here. Why don't you pack a bag and come up on a Saturday morning and... And spend the weekend, and, and we're going to see how far we can, you know, go with, with all this. Because we're going to make you a star kind of thing. So, you know, I'm like, okay, well, okay, we'll, we'll see about all this. So I packed my bags and, and, and left early. Got in my coupe de ville and told my mother, if you see me coming back down this driveway tonight, then you'll know something shady was going down. So I get to Palm Springs and to Hot Springs and, and the guy is standing out, you know, in front, you know, we whipped out the Thomas guy and he's standing outside and I'm looking at him. He's a older kind of silver haired Jewish kind of guy and I'm going, okay, all right. And so I um, go in and and, and we, we, we sit down in a, in a gorgeous, gorgeous place. He happened to be the son of a very, very successful, wealthy woman who was in the movies. I'm talking about big movie star back in the days when the movies were monochromatic and he had been adopted. So he was an heir to her, all of her wealth. And, and plus he was in the entertainment business. And so, and so what I did was did something really stupid. <laughs> sat down and accepted a drink. Can I make you a drink? You don't do that. Don't sit up and have a drink. What anything could be in that drink? Well I took the drink and and so it you know, it was just wine and so 
we started talking and we talked a little more and more. And he said that, um, you know, you are a lot more than we than I expected. And I have a group of people and we would be interested in doing something very interesting with you. And I'm like, okay, what's what? what? He said, because you're a singer, we want to make you the number one singer in the world in the next five years. Then after that, we're going to put you in movies like they did Elvis. And we're going to make you the number one actor in the world. And then we're going to take a 15 year break and you, my brother, will be the first black president of the United States. <laughs> and this was when Clinton, this would have been at the same time when Clinton or right after Clinton. So I'm like, this is the, what in the hell is all this? And then he said, all you have to do is one thing for me. And I'm like, okay, what's the catch? He said, you have to let me do your manicures and pedicures. I said, okay, I see where this is going. Okay, well, hey, you know what? Hey, man, toast to that, you know. And we kept talking and talking, and I, my instincts was to make him feel as comfortable so he could tell me as much as I could, you know, get out of him. And he kept on going. And I said, you know what, the thing about it is, he told me I could move in here and blah, 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 blah. I said, you know, I have too much family in Pasadena. I need to get, he said, you know how much money I can get for this place. We can live anywhere in the world where you want to live. And he told me because of the wealth that he had growing up, he looks at life differently now and he likes to be treated a certain way. The man said he wanted me to treat him like a slave. The man said, if I want to sleep in the mansion and I want him to sleep out in the middle of the street, he would do that. He said, if you want me to sleep on the roof or whatever you say, and he told me I would really appreciate it if you took your hand and just knocked me upside my head every now and then. So I said, well, I don't like the whole slave thing and, and I'm not abusive, but you know, I'll, I, I can push you around a little bit if you, that's what you need. He said, please. And, and, I, and every time he got more comfortable, he would add something on to all I had to do list. Started off with the manicures and pedicures, but then he said, all you have to do is manicures, pedi pedicures, and let me watch you take a shower. Okay, shower, all right, shower, yeah. yeah. So he kept talking, he took me for a tour around the place and then he said, uh, you see this beautiful yard? Imagine this on an acid trip. And I'm like, <laughs> glad he don't have no acid because, you, know, you know, I might not leave. I could end up dead back here and buried. Nobody knows where I am. And so I just kept making him feel more comfortable. I made him feel like, ooh, this is a wonderful opportunity, blah, 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 blah. And he said, I said, well, wait, wait, wait. First of all, what would it look like, me sitting here, living in a big house with you? <laughs> he, and then this is the part that really, this is what sucks you in. I think this is how they get the brothers. You will never, ever, ever, he said, have to worry about a woman. He said that if there is any woman in the world that you want, we will fly there and pick her up. And by the time she meets you, meets you, she will be so already in love with you because we're going to get old. And she will be like putty in your hands. Now, the presidency thing didn't sound all that appealing. The acting thing didn't either. But to have any woman in the world... <laughs> And he said an unlimited budget. You would always have at least three or $400,000 in your account. You can buy any kind of car. I'm like, this is, this is, this is kind of deep. And all the women, so I said, wait, wait, wait. You mean to tell me that if I wanted Jane Kennedy, Jane Kennedy was a very fabulous model at the time that I worked with. And so he said, Jane Kennedy is already yours. I was like, 
Wow. I think this is how they promised these people, these brothers, these young people. They promised them all these things and some of them are so overwhelming that are, they're just damn too hard to refuse. Because by this time I'm going live anywhere I want an unlimited budget I could be Teddy Pendergrass then I could be Sidney Poitier and then I could be Bill Clinton and all I have to do by this time I hadn't made him feel so comfortable he was just oh he was I think he was tipsy and he said to me he said you know we've we thought about trying this before on a, another black man and as a matter of fact, he was the former, one of the former heavyweight champions of the world. And he told me who it was, and I was like, wow. Because <laughs> this is already somebody who already threatened to kick my butt one time because was, we was dating the same girl. <laughs> so anyway, he said that the negotiations were going good until I showed him this, and he pulled his shirt up. And showed me his chest. And he had an earring on his nipple. And this was back in the 70s. This is about like 1982. And I was like, ouch. <laughs> you know. He said as soon as he showed the boxer that, the boxer's eyes got big. And he started sweating. And, he, and the man said, it scared him. <laughs> you know, it scared me. I was like, he was scared of him. He said, but Kurt, you 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 handled that well. You were cool. You, man, you are perfect for this. I was like, you know, um, <laughs> at this particular point, my mind was just a blank. I was like, what in the hell am I about to get myself into? And then he said, he was so comfortable by this time. He said, let me show you this room. We walked into the room, and it was artwork on the walls. But on these walls were pictures of black men. I knew they were black because they were facing the back of them, and they had big naturals. They were sketches, not really art, but they were like black and white. And they had big naturals and muscles and stuff, and... And I'm not even going to tell you what it looked like they was doing because it's too nasty. But anyway, I looked and I was like, man, you are freaky. He's like, I sure am. Now, at this particular point, I had heard all I needed to hear as far as where this was going to go. At any point in the middle of all of this, I'm going to, I am sell, about to sell my soul to the devil. I am at the crossroads at this particular point. And so we went in. He made me another drink. And we're sitting there smiling, acting, already acting like, oh, he's thinking he got me now. But all of a sudden, something very peculiar happened. Remember that girl Janice I told you about in the beginning? All of a sudden, I heard a voice, and it said, Janice, and my eyes got big, and it said it again, and it kept saying it, and I, and I knew it was that quantum entanglement. I didn't know about quantum entanglement at the time. All I knew was this sound of this woman's voice was more powerful than anything he was talking about, and I said, Janice. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I got to go see Janice. And I told him, I said, look, man, let me tell you something. Everything you're saying is beautiful, and I'm sure we're going to work out something, but I do my best thinking when I'm driving. So I'm going to head on back to Pasadena, and I'm going to call you up tomorrow, man, and see what we can work out. <laughs> he really thought I was coming back because he wasn't even disappointed. He was like, oh, look forward to hearing from you, right? My plan was to drive around the corner or something and go to sleep, sleep off the wine, and then get on the freeway and go take my behind home. 
But the sound of this woman's voice, bam, 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 kept coming through my head. By the time I got my car started, I was completely sober. I got on that freeway, the 10 freeway, and I was on my way back <laughs> to Pasadena. Got to Lincoln Boulevard, and I went back up that same street where I saw that bush. And I, and the moral of this story is watch out for wolves, number one. It is. They will promise you so many things. It's almost like they already know what your fantasies are, which is easy to do. Uh, and But my biggest takeaway was now that I understand how spirituality works when you connect with your spirit. I never had a chance to date this woman. We never dated. We never got close like that. We went out a few times, but nothing happened. However, my spirit knew back then that it could use her to save my ass later on, literally. I believe that my spirit set that whole thing up, passed by Janice's house, because you're going to need this image in the future. And that's how spirituality works. When you connect with your spirit, it will save you from things that haven't even happened yet. My spirit knew that one day I would be trapped in this situation. I would be at a crossroad. But instead of taking that road, just the voice of a woman. So if anybody knows where Janice is, um, and you hear this story, if, you, if you're if familiar with any of the people I mentioned, um, somebody tell her, thanks for saving my life. <laughs> because I believe that's what she did. And another thing about Diddy, I don't expect him to get in a lot of trouble because the industry needs people like him to recruit the people that they're preparing to abuse. They're always going to be, there was a Quincy Jones, and a, there will always be somebody to set up the trap for you. And Diddy seems to be a very good trap maker, so I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't find nothing and he continues to work his business because if not him, they're going to find another one. Now, getting back to the book series, I'd like to show you the next chapter of the book. We're coming to the end of the book. We only have three more chapters left. So this, was, this one is ethereal heaven. You know, there's four, five levels of heaven. You know, your atmospheric heaven, your lower, middle, upper, ethereal realm. This is the ethereal realm. I hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you when you come back. Today is the last day of heaven class in the mystery schools. The priest began. Conceptualization is the basis of human thought, yet we must conceive the inconceivable. Explore that which has been unimaginable. We must think the unthinkable. Explore the circles that bind our limited paradigms. Imagine no space before there was no time. There, the past, present, and future are the same. This can and will for always be difficult. Difficult when you realize that our existence is based on linear time. A beginning and an end. We live and we die corporeally. This, however, is not the extent of our existence. Before physical, before material, before corporeal, there was the spiritual. In this place, the before mentioned is more real than what we now conceive or formulate as reality. Imagine no pain, no suffering, no sickness, nor loneliness. No greed or hunger, neither ego nor pride, nor day or night. No guilt or shame, no hate and no joy. At least as we conceive or comprehend joy. There is such a place, and that place is called the ethereal realm. The ethereal realm is the domain of the supreme God, the master, the infinite all. Of him you need not fear. Fear that which is pernicious, deleterious, or maleficent. 
For he is love, and love is he, he is love personified. For him you need not search, we used to believe that he is ubiquitous, living within us. However, we have since begun to understand that he is not ubiquitous, nor does he live within us. It has now been recently discovered from prophetic knowledge of these things called holograms. We do not understand such things, however. They seem to be true, and we must get used to it. They now say that we no longer have the all living inside of us, but rather it is we that live inside the mind of Him. Therefore, He has no need to be in this place and then that place, because He is already everywhere in the first place. With Him, you have no need. He is omnipotent because he is already there. The true God has no equal. He is all of all things. The true God is not a God. He is the maker of gods, the maker of lords. He is the creator and the maintainer of the physical and spiritual universe. He is the true Alpha and the Omega and the ethereal realm is where he subsists and exists. This is where he has always existed. Duality complete and the ethereal is his realm. For the true God there is no beginning. He has always been and will always be. The one true God there is no ending for reasons the same. If you wonder from whence he came the answer is everywhere. If you ponder where he is going, the answer will be all places at once. The ethereal realm is where he exists. It is where he is most relaxed and it is where he is most joyous. And since he is there, then we too must also be there within him. It is from there because of reason the Master Controller conceived a holographic virtual corporeal existence based upon subatomic particles and pixelated plank lengths. Whatever all this means, even we do not understand it all. However, you students must be given the chance to proceed. Perhaps one of you may be the one that can better give us understanding. Holograms, particles, and pixelated lens? asked Jesus. Let us continue. If you were in Etheria, you would be without shape, yet with form. If there, you would be without rhythm, yet purely rhythmatic. When there, your spirit need not vibrate, for you would be vibration. If there, you shall be both cold and hot. You shall be both dry yet wet. You shall be both loud, yet quiet. You shall be mindful, for there, mind is all. There, you shall be both cause and effect simultaneously. You shall be both male and female, genderless. You will be delicate. You shall be exquisite. You will be dainty and elegant, graceful, beautiful and lovely. All these things shall you be, and you shall dwell there forever, or until you determine not to. For to exist there, you shall be without challenge or chaos, fear or loneliness, and no suffering. There will be no growth. You will forever be stagnant forever the same, forever without body or measure or gain. Such is the life in the ethereal realm of the true God. You are such and such are you, an all spark, a super particle of the omnipotent and formerly thought of as ubiquitous true God. As the students rushed out, the priest shouted, Students, now study the papyrus. No longer are they in cuneiform. 
We now have them in the Greek. It is the language of the gods. So subscribe and push the like button. Thank you, everybody. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Love everybody. We'll see you on the next show. Right there, right there.